The most memorable thing about being on an icebreaker is seeing the ice and breaking the ice. It's like nothing you've ever seen before, and you hope that you always get to see it. In April and May, the sea ice is still present, but it is beginning to melt. All of a sudden, the sunlight can get into the ocean. You start to see photosynthesis occurring, both in the water and under the ice. There's lots of nutrients, which are like fertilizer for plants. And so all the phytoplankton, which are the plants that live in the water column, suddenly start to grow so that you have this incredible increase in plant weight and abundance. Copepods, which are small crustaceans, and the krill, which look sort of like shrimp, use this phytoplankton as food, and then they start to reproduce. The copepods and the krill just can't eat all of this incredible amount of food that's suddenly laid out for them. And so it will sink through the water and it goes down to the seafloor, and the animals that live on the seafloor also can start to eat this incredible new amount of food that they've got. Zooplankton, in turn, are consumed by fish, and the fish are, in turn, consumed by larger animals, such as seals and, of course, humans. The southern Bering Sea is well known as an important region for commercial fishing, such as pollock. It's probably one of the most important pollock fisheries in the world. And it's also very important for some of the larger animals, such as whales and walrus and seals. The people who have lived there have used the resources of the Bering Sea for a really long time. And they're also extremely interested in ongoing climate change because they do see things going on, changes in weather, changes in ice, that they feel is impacting the way that they live their lives. What would be the changes in the ecosystem if, for instance, the sea ice was to disappear. To understand if the Bering Sea is going to continue to be the wonderful place for a whale to live, we have to try to understand how it works and then to try to predict how the changes in sea ice or water temperature might impact it. We really know very little about the Arctic ecosystem. The environment is so hostile that it's very difficult to work there. It's difficult to access it. To get into the Arctic Ocean, until most recently, you had to have an icebreaker. Our expedition is done from the US Coast Guard Cutter Healy. She's the Coast Guard's largest ship. She's 420 feet long, and her primary mission is science. There's a number of groups that will go out and work on the ice. For this, we'll pick an ice flow that looks safe, and then the ship will sort of nudge up to the ice flow, and it will stop, and we'll put a big ramp out. Bridge, folks will catch them to the ice. Roger, catch them to the ice. And the scientists drill cores, and they, they look to see what, how many plants and animals there are in the sea ice. One of the scientists is gonna put a very small ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, which is this little thing that kind of propels itself around under the ice. We have one group who's looking at the primary production, that's the photosynthesis, so they'll be collecting water and incubating it to see how much primary production is, is ongoing. We have a couple of groups that are looking at zooplankton. The ultimate goal here is to try to understand how much of the photosynthesis can they eat? It's like cows grazing down a pasture. Can the zooplankton eat all the plant material that's produced? Then we have another group who's looking at some of the processes in, in the seafloor. They take cores of mud and try to look at some of the chemical transformations that are going on that are, are conducted by the animals that live in the mud itself. And then we have one group looking at the distribution and abundance of the seabirds. When we stop at what we call a station, the first thing we typically do is we put in an instrument called a CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. Basically what it does is we lower it through the water and it measures the temperature of the water and the saltiness of the water. And it also has a bunch of bottles attached to it so that we can collect a water sample. Another thing we do is some plankton toes. This is to catch the zooplankton. Another thing we'll do at a sample location is what's called the multi-core. We lower it down to the seafloor and the cores drop down and they get this nice column of mud with animals in it. 
Another instrument we'll be using is a video plankton recorder. And this is basically an underwater microscope that we lower through the water and it takes pictures of what's in the water. And so we can get an idea of who's there, what type of animals are found, and what types of plants are found where. And finally, we do um, sampling with all these grabs as well for the seafloor. It collects a big wad of mud and comes back up and the, the scientists are looking for the larger animals that are found in that mud. So one of the things that we were most interested in, in finding on this cruise was to document what goes on in the ecosystem during the onset of the spring bloom. We wanted to see how fast the bloom would evolve, that is, how fast it grows, and what the response of these animals in the water and also on the seafloor is to this sudden bonanza of food. So we were very excited when on April 26th we found a spring bloom in an area that had been previously ice covered. The ice had retreated and moved away from that part of the water and this incredible phytoplankton bloom had started to grow. We just came back to the same spot and sampled it day after day after day to see how are things changing. Those fish that are being harvested, pollock especially, depend critically on these components of the ecosystem that we were studying on this cruise because that's what they eat. So the idea is that if you can understand what's going to happen to the pollock, we may have a chance of regulating our fishery so that we can sustain it and so that there will still be a fishery of pollock in the Bering Sea under climate change. In the future, we really can't change climate change. We hopefully, as a team in the end, will be able to understand how climate change could potentially impact this ecosystem.